Hello, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about mm, old stuff and uh, You're stuff. You're just making it up? Yeah, well, I, us- I usually have the same spiel every time, but I tried to change it up, and mm. it bombed horribly. So my name is Thomas Magby. I'm joined, as always, by Graham Donaldson. Hi. And AJ Hannenberg. Hello. All right. So when I asked Graham what he was talking about today... What did you just say? It's kind of about Mim- teaching how to teach. Yeah. Mimetic teaching. Mimesis. Kind of. That was it. M- kind of. Mimesis, of. Mimesis so, kind of. Mimesis kind of. That's the name of my autobiography. M- yeah. So. Well, if you want the like the sexy tagline, we could oh, call it like, oh, yeah. how does the Bible teach us to teach? That's good. We put okay. it that way. So is this a, a classical stuff after dark episode? Yeah. It's yeah. not very okay. sexy. Yeah. Sex wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't like that, actually. No, no. That, that sounds... I regret yeah. that. Anyway. Sorry, everyone. Um, anyway, so, <laughs> so we are talking about, so how do, <laughs> oh, another tagline you could put on this is, how would you teach math classically? That's kind of how I, I, I got into thinking about this hmm. topic. That's an interesting question. Um, because we spend a lot of time on this podcast talking about literature and history and books about people that are talking about virtue in the classical world. But if you are in a science classroom or a math classroom, how do you teach like, what is the pedagogy of teaching that kind of thing classically? Don't you just and give them Euclid's, is it Euclid's elements? Like, it's just all, make them read that? Well, it's a, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think Euclid, it's it's like a, it's a series of proofs, but mm-hmm. each proof builds on the previous one. Mm-hmm. And so like, in the, so we've talked, we've talked about some part of classical being starting mm-hmm. with building blocks and then kind of going from there. Yep. So that's definitely a part of it. Yeah. But I'm thinking even more, how do you get the kids to understand the proofs in the first place? Do you just show them the proofs? How do you actually get them to, to, to self-discovery? Yeah. So this is, so, and, hmm. and like, uh, some sort of application context, mm-hmm. yeah. right? So say you need to figure out how to trace this ball without actually having the, like perfectly mm-hmm. without you know, whatever. Yeah. So the, uh, the idea of this comes from one of the Platonic dialogues whose name I can't remember right now. Is it um, the Phaedrus maybe? I can't remember. Um, but it's this idea that um, Plato says that the teacher needs to understand the soul of the student and fit to that soul. Uh, so this is the so certain, learning styles. So yes, exactly. Yes, <laughs> the kinetic <laughs> learner and uh, oral. And uh, Do you not actually like that? I don't. I don't no. think there's – no. Um, I think – classically i think the human person classically understood is that we all learn the same way but when someone says i learn by hearing i learn by seeing i learn by doing um i think one some of those are easier than the other uh, yeah so it's easier to teach some of those ways than others no i just think that um um or are you I think when people say I'm an oral learner, I'm a visual learner, I'm a I'm a like hands-on learner. Um, um, everybody is all of those things. Yes. And uh, and some and those things based on the thing that you're teaching, some of those things are better to do than the others. Yes. Um, and so you kind of need to be able to do all three. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter if you're better at hands-on learning mm-hmm. if, if you just need to listen to a lecture. Like need- for example, reading is harder than pictures. Because you're doing, you are having to do uh, a couple More of work. cognitive yeah. things. You are looking at the scribbles on a page, and then you're having to imagine or somehow turn those words into the idea that they're that they're corresponding to. Yep. So you have to make your own image in your mind, um, very basically. But if you're looking at an image, that step is removed for you. Right. So. It, Huh. If someone says I'm a visual learner as opposed to someone who really understands things by reading, it's like, no, it's that the visual learner, that's an easier cognitive step than than the harder thing, which is the Called word out. that wow. corresponds to the picture, which corresponds to the idea. Yeah, sure. At least that, that's my conviction of it. Um, and then um, – um, but this this comes down to a, a lot more basic concept. All of three of those things, uh, learning through reading, through pictures, and through action, come down to this idea of mimesis, or this idea that you actually learn by mimicking, or you actually learn by um, by um, you don't you don't learn in the realm of ideas. You learn in the realm of examples. Yep. This is sort of the core classical conviction. So, what do I mean by this? So. Um, oh, shoot. I'm trying to think of maybe a, a good example. So you have a dog, maybe, right? Do. What's your dog's yes. name? Eliza. And um, can you describe Eliza not as a dog, but as the, the things that are particular to Eliza? Like her personality that Fun is... Fun-loving, mm-hmm. always excited, uh, positive, uh, loyal, pretty obedient, mm-hmm. modestly obedient. 
Um, have you ever had other dogs in your life? I have. Growing up? Yeah. How did were that, was that your childhood dog different than Eliza? I had golden retrievers growing up also. Mm-hmm. So there is a common, there's a commonality of like the excitement. Okay, and, let's start with commonality. So yeah. how are all golden retrievers alike? Yeah, they're all, all the ones I've had are, they're <clears throat> again, very excited or excitable. Mm-hmm. Um, just very happy to see and be around people. Friendly, um, sometimes too friendly. Uh yeah, and usually pretty easy to train. Uh, again, that obedient side of things. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are all pretty common between all of them. Mm-hmm. Can you um, remember any differences between uh, Eliza and what's your childhood dog's name? Uh, Maggie. And was, Maggie. Um, they are different sizes. Mm-hmm. Um, they are different shapes. They. Um, I'm trying to think of other differences. I can't. I don't have any like brilliant. Well, what about in training? I know with Eliza, you train her by you have the. Uh, a oh, we're collar. training her differently. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So she has a little collar that vibrates if mm-hmm. she's doing something wrong. Um, we didn't have that with Maggie. Um, what? What? When you're training Eliza, what failed? What did you try uh, to do to train her and it didn't work? Oh, uh, well, the clearest failure is that she still jumps on people when they walk into our house. Mm-hmm. But are you asking about our technique and what yeah. hasn't worked? Mm-hmm. Um, for a while, so we didn't have that training collar for a long time because we only wanted to train through positive reinforcement mm-hmm. and it didn't work mm-hmm. because she would kind of do whatever she wanted to and she would get so if she did right she'd get treats and if she didn't do right there was no punishment there was no punishment yeah. okay so her life was just fantastic was awesome. all the time yeah, and then too, sometimes yeah, treats yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so then we added this little collar and again all it does is like vibrate it's really i mean it's not it doesn't do very much but that's enough to like cause her to be like oh i'm doing something wrong okay um, so you tried something it didn't work and yeah. then you tried something and else fixed, and you had more success fixed it. Yeah, and yeah. so you had to sort of play around mm-hmm. with um seeing how these things worked yeah so if you were if you decided to quit your job and become a golden retriever trainer yeah sure that'd be um, horrible but yeah this so this would be how you would figure out um how to train golden retrievers you would have lots of different golden retrievers and mm-hmm. you would try all these sorts mm-hmm. of things and see what works and you would come across the types of um of, you know, things that worked with all mm-hmm. golden retrievers. Yep. But then every once in a while, I'm sure there's going to be things that a work with specific difference. golden retrievers totally. and don't work with other golden yeah, retrievers. Totally. Okay. So um, with those golden retrievers, so Eliza mm-hmm. is an example of a golden retriever, mm-hmm. right? Um, and Maggie was another example of a golden retriever. Yeah. And if you, the skilled golden retriever trainer, know the characteristics that are that are common to all golden retrievers, mm-hmm. and if you had a lot of examples, you would also be able to tell the the differences between yep. all of these golden retrievers, right? Sure. Um, so I guess what I'm getting with this is like um, uh, we're starting with the idea, with the concept of definition. We mm-hmm. talked about definition on common on common topics, common topics before. How you define something, AJ? Can you give like a real fast primer on like what definition was again? Definition is the practice of delineating something's category and subcategories. Okay, so that's right to the point. Wow. Yes. Okay. I um, just taught logic, wow, so this good. is for excellent. Excellent. Okay. Wow. So when you're when you're defining something, you are just you you can't no. So what are the things that a definition can't do? Like that was that was a uh, bad you're, you're basically question. setting limits on something. You're setting exa- okay, perfect. You're setting limits on something. Mm-hmm. So you're saying within this boundary, Eliza and Maggie are golden retrievers. Yeah, there's something common to both outside of, yeah. of this boundary. They are no longer golden retrievers. So oh, like 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 if you had a golden retriever and you had a Dachshund, uh-huh. um, you would They're have different. You would, so they are. The, the definitions are different. They're sure. still dogs, um, but the golden retriever definition is different. Yeah, but a definition does not. Um, describe what something is under every circumstance. Okay. So let's say you had a more melancholy golden retriever, okay. and then you have Eliza, which is not a, <laughs> not melancholy, a melancholy golden yeah, retriever. Yeah, yeah. I know Eliza. Yeah. <laughs> Very. Is that saying? Um, is that? Yeah. They would still be golden retrievers, but you would have these examples of of individual golden retrievers, and they're still golden retrievers, but they they do have these differences. Mm-hmm. So the definition of golden retriever isn't something that describes a golden retriever under every circumstance, but yeah, describes the limits or. De- Excuse me. Defines the limits wherein I'm still. I, I don't know why I'm drawing with my hands. No one can see that. <laughs> he drew a box. Let, let the audience box, yeah. maybe a triangle. Let the audience know he drew a box. Okay, good. Imagine yeah. a box. Imagine, um, and <laughs> so it, it defines the limits wherein a golden retriever is still uh-huh. a golden retriever. Yeah. And then the so uh, and um, the skilled trainer of the golden retriever is somebody who has seen many many different instances mm-hmm. of the golden retriever and can say. 
either it can say something like these r- these colors always work mm-hmm. or it can say um you know the tr- the 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 positive reinforcement never works with golden retrievers ever because right. i've tried that with seven different kinds of golden retrievers and it sure. never worked yep. or you can say that was just an eliza thing it really worked with with this other golden retriever sure. okay so is that some form of like smaller definition so there's golden retriever but then they're kind of like sub Categories within Maybe. that? Maybe. That would be subcategories. So, yeah, a, mm-hmm. so uh, as you, if, if you're talking in the logic world, you uh-huh. are wor- working your way further down the genus and species chart. Okay. So basically like you are saying, okay, within golden retriever, there are three different types. There okay. are cranky golden retrievers, there are happy golden retrievers, and then there's like mm-hmm. slop, you know, slop. <laughs> mm-hmm. sure. So okay. you have the ones that don't respond, that respond well to positive reinforcement. Those are the cranky ones because okay. their world is terrible. And so they want to keep on getting snacks. Probably. You have the happy ones and they like negative reinforcement because uh-huh. otherwise their world is just roses all the time. Right. And then you have the slobs who you have to like any sort of reinforcement just to get them moving. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you are moving again. So now we have a further, further limit. So okay. a golden retriever, that is a slob. That's a, mm-hmm. that, More there, there might be a different word for that. Like a, uh, you know, like a tarnished retriever mm, mm-hmm. oh, okay. something. <laughs> and so you're getting at that you would tailor your Not, training no, approach. I don't oh. want, I, I think if you do that, like uh, uh, when you're talking about golden retrievers as example, so each golden retriever is an example of this concept of golden retriever or the idea of golden retriever. But I think uh, just uh, if you, if you try to optimize it too much, I think you actually get to the point where each individual golden retriever has its own idiosyncrasies. And so there are helpful guidelines for training golden retrievers, but with the specific example of the golden retriever, you're always going to have to play with the specific example. Yep. So yes, you can say that there's melancholy golden retrievers and that there are phlegmatic golden retrievers and that there are sanguine golden retrievers and that there are... Way to use fancy words for it. <laughs> what are the other ones? What's the fourth one? Choleric, did you say that? Choleric, f- Choleric uh, sanguine, sanguine melancholy. phlegmatic, and melancholy. Okay, yeah, there you go. go yeah, that's fine. So, you know, so there's those different types of, types of golden retrievers. Yep. But then each of those individual golden retrievers, there's going to be the idiosyncrasies that sort of define optimization. There's going to be, the ex- the example is going to be its own example, and there's going to be these helpful things. So if you are training a golden retriever, you're still going to have to um, train the specific thing. You're not training the idea of the golden retriever. You're training Maggie mm-hmm. or Eliza. Right. And if you want her to stop grabbing the leash when you're on a walk, mm-hmm. um, there's probably tricks that work for all golden retrievers, but eventually you're going to find the one that works for Eliza. Yeah. So what I'm getting at is that to learn about golden retrievers, to be able to say, I am a good trainer of golden retrievers, you have spent lots and lots of times with examples mm-hmm. of golden retrievers. In yeah. fact, when it comes to golden retrievers, there's... There's, there's no other way to do it. Mm. You, you, um, I suppose maybe someone could write a book about golden retrievers and mm-hmm. you could do it that way. But which trainer would you want to send Eliza to? Exactly. And the, and when, so when we first got Eliza, we would read uh, different trainers' books on what to do with this dog, and they all contradicted each other. Yeah. Because they all... I guess they all had a different set that they were building their principles around. Oh, I mean, around. this is like parenting books. Yeah, Positive it's the exact reinforcement. Same. Yeah. Only spank them all the time. Or, I don't know. <laughs> right, sure. I, I would only purchase the book that had the best pun. And in this case, I think ah. it would be The Golden Rule mm-hmm. oh. Training Retrievers. There you go. Does mm-hmm. that book exist? I don't should, know, but that's a pretty. Or yeah, The Golden <laughs> Rule Retrieving the Lost Art of <laughs> oh, Training. Yeah, there, there you go. go. <laughs> we guys, Perfect. we did. Yeah, Why are we a publishing yeah. company? That's <laughs> what I want to know. Let's go write a book. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so you would so you would want the person <laughs> so that had the most ex- uh, experience yes. with different examples of yes. retrievers, as opposed to someone who maybe was an adherent of a specific school but has sure. never trained a retriever in their life. Sure, right, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So this is true of retrievers. This is true of horses. This is true of gardening, of farming. Like you can know a lot about bougainvillea. Um, and uh, what? Is that a bougainvillea? Spanish what? dish? A uh, bougainvillea is a plant. Say? Uh, Bougain, it is a beautiful. You sometimes see it. It, um, uh, it bougainvillea is a beautiful. Uh, it's it's it does flower, but its leaves turn bright, vibrant colors. You see it somewhere in hot climates, so okay. like in Texas. I figured you guys. Are you, you gardener signaling right you now? You of all people, maybe. <laughs> like, yeah, it's a thing. <laughs> like, how do you think it's spelled? Just B O U G E N V I L L A. I think bougainvillea. Yeah, it's close. Yeah. I that like pink looking thing. It's oh. the pink looking thing. Yes, okay. it's in Hawaii. It's oh, cool. It's gorgeous. Oh, you anyway. pre- yeah, I, I know the Texan pronunciation. 
Bougainvillea. <laughs> Bougainvillea. <laughs> um, but it's a very beautiful plant. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it, it's yeah. pretty fernickety. Uh, persnickety. What? Fernickety. <laughs> what is happening? Like you need specific kinds of soil and you need, and if you want it to flower, you can't water it too much. You know, there's there's things that you learn I've heard by it, using examples of it. I've heard that it can be a nightmare to grow. Is, are you just reading? No, I just... Did, oh. you, <laughs> did, you, did you mix... A nightmare. Frenetic and persnickety? I yes. think I probably did. Was it those did. two? Yeah. Frenetity? Yeah. Frenetity? Yeah. That's, like, that's not a bad yeah. word. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, for example, like, like yeah, this is true for gardening. This is true for, for, ra- for, for raising kids. You can read all the books that you want, but you've got an example. And what is the idea or the type that a child is an example of? They're an example of human. Yeah, is exactly. Yeah. They're an example of, a, of the of the idea of the human person. Yeah. So a golden retriever is an example well, of is, the, okay. of so golden you, retriever. But they're thing. not an example of child. You do you want to draw that distinction? You could. Yeah. I mean, a human pe- being is an example of lots of things. Like yeah. we are examples of teachers. Uh-huh. We are examples of males. Uh-huh. We are example of humans. We are examples of Christians. Yeah. Okay. We are so example. Of, you know, so there's lots okay. of different things that you can do. Okay. Um, Models. Yeah. Yeah, my models. Uh, um, we're example of models. Yeah, we're example. Yeah. Well, we're a example. <laughs> on, <laughs> poor example. Yeah, on, yeah. Um, you know, um, radio voice. Yeah, or in the technical sense of we're played on car radios when Bluetooth is connected exactly. to them. Is, okay, yeah. great. Okay, good. Um, so, I, just like how the golden retriever is an example of a dog, yes. it's an example of an animal. Yes. It's an example of a living thing. Um, so you can go through all the all the kingdoms and phylums and classes and orders and families. But so um, to learn how to train a retriever, you play with all of the different examples. I, I can't really think of a better word than play. Or you, you, you spend time with all of the different examples of all the different kinds of golden retrievers, and you begin to learn what is mm-hmm. common to all the golden retrievers and what makes, what, what makes it work and how you can achieve the ends. Yeah. It's not going to grab the leash. It's going to obey, it's going to obey you. It's not going to jump on your guests. It's going to, you know, stop doing the things that you want it to do. Right. Yeah. We hope. Okay. So, um, and so, uh, the person who's learning this does this by examples. Um, so uh, the archetype that I'm talking about is you have examples, specific instances, and then every example corresponds to an idea okay the idea being golden retrieverness mm-hmm. um and or uh the my specific bougainvillea that i'm growing in a pot is an example of bougainvilleas and, lo- and bougainvilleas like certain kinds of things but maybe this specific bougainvillea is going to because of its context it, I, I need to sort of like I can't just do it by the book, as, mm-hmm. as I guess what I'm saying. Yep. You, you, you kind of need to have your wits about you and go back and sort of s- and try and fail a lot and see what works mm-hmm. for um, achieving the ends that you know is possible with Bougainvillea, beautiful yep. flowering plant, right? So um, this kind of um, learning through examples requ- involves a lot of, of trial, error, and failure. Yep. Okay. Um, but this is the way that human beings learn um, uh, more than, um, than if, if, but then if someone just sort of told you how to train a dog. So you, you read right. all these books and you right. said they contradicted themselves. Right. Um, then we just had to learn what worked for Eliza. And you still Eliza. had to learn what, what worked for Eliza and there was yeah. a lot of trial and error. Yes. You tried the treats, didn't work, tried the collar, collar's working, right? And then we're good. And yeah. then you're good. So how can we replicate this kind of method in the classroom? Well, it's we we do it in terms of uh, of teaching English uh, and teaching uh, 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 stories. So how do we do it in? How do we do it with? I, the, we well, I, I tried yeah. callers. Callers, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what I assumed we were going to. Yeah. I got a lot of emails about yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, really positive emails. Awesome. Parents oh were like, "This is goodness. incredible." He has never been so well behaved <laughs> yeah. in his entire Why life. Why did we do this earlier? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, well, maybe we can talk about how we do an English class later. But how we so in a math class? So the way that I was taught math was. All right, guys, here's a formula. And so, if the, or here's a rule. And the rule is that all of the internal angles of a triangle equal, let me remember, 180, 180 mm-hmm. degrees. Yeah. Okay. So, here's the rule. Write it down in your little rule book. Mm-hmm. Memorize this. You're going to need it for the test. Okay. That's one way to learn it. And um, uh, I posit and, um, that that is a less effective way to learn it than if the student is able to play with examples and come to the rule themselves through sure. questions. So how would you do this? You would put all sorts of different kinds of triangles on the board, an isosceles triangle, a triangle with a right angle, 
an obtuse triangle. I can't remember them all. A acute, acute, acute triangle. Yeah. And you would put all these different triangles on the board and you would label the angles. Mm-hmm. And you would, you as a teacher know that you want the student to get to all the internal angles equal 180. The wrong way to do this is, to, is just to say, Tell them. what do all internal angles equal? Yeah. That's, that's not the way to do it. It's... Um, doing some sort of games of observation, um, doing some, uh, you know, uh, asking leading questions. Maybe you start with one triangle and you do another one, or maybe you start with a, with a definition of triangle. You Why? give them a paper triangle, mm-hmm. have them cut it into three pieces where they have the three corners, yep. and then let them play with them until they realize that, like, if they put all those three corners together, they'll always have a straight line when they're done. Exactly. So all, exa- yeah, okay. all sorts of these different things. Yep. And then you get to the point where... They've played with enough examples that they can say with confidence, all of these triangles, the internal angles equal 180. They may not phrase it that way, but they could get the idea of it. Sure. Um, same thing if you were trying to teach them A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That is the idea. That is uh, A squared plus B squared equals C squared is an idea about triangles. Mm-hmm. It, is a, it is something that exists of triangles. Um, is it just right angle triangles, right? Or Just right angle. Just right. So... Um, so you could put in a bunch of different sized right angle triangles, measure all of the sides, and then try to figure out if there's some sort of relationship mm-hmm. between all of these numbers. Is the bottom one, if the bottom one on this triangle was 15 and the bottom one on that triangle was 7, and the, the side angle on this one was 8, and the side angle on that one was, and then whatever the number is, and you can say like, hey, is there some sort of relationship between these numbers? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know that there is, but if the student can sort of, if you can lead them through giving them um, easy little logical hurdles to jump over, that eventually they'll get to that, oh, right. oh, I, I get, yo, oh, what if we did? And then they, they, they figure it out, and then, I'll, and then they will know that forever. Mm-hmm. Um, because they've played with enough examples that they understand the idea of triangle. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've developed it themselves. And they've developed them themselves. Instead of them being told. Um, you know, this... this um, um, this is a, a difficult, uh, this is time consuming exercise and it can be rife with failure mm-hmm. all the time. So it's possible that you could end math class with the entire class, not coming to the cl- conclusion that you have. Mm-hmm. And I would say that it would be a failure at the end of the class. You'd be like, all right, guys, well, you just didn't get it. The answer is a squared plus B squared equals C squared moving on. I'm, but I mean, that's sort of a demoralizing thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, if in many ways, so if you wanted to do this kind of mimetic or this kind of uh, uh, example-based learning, you've got to be prepared to end in failure and then try again later. Chances are that, but if, when, when students are given these kinds of puzzles, so I'm not a math teacher, uh, and, but every once in a while, I will do a either in between class or just on, in lunch or something, I will give our students an incredibly difficult math problem mm-hmm. that I really like. And it's a classical math problem, so it's even better. <laughs> Um, so Josephus was a ancient Jewish, we, call, we refer to him as a historian now because he wrote a history, um, but he was part of the Jewish rebellion against Rome in 70 AD, and he and his Jewish rebellion, rebellion rebellers were <laughs> uh-huh. in Masada uh, on this mountain fortress, and the Romans had them surrounded and they were going to kill them, and then the Jews were like, well, we don't want to be slaves to Rome, we're going we're gonna to kill ourselves, but we have a problem. We can't kill ourselves because it's against Jewish uh, religion. Yeah. So what they decided to do was they would all get in a circle, and the person who uh, and you would kill the person to your left, and then that person would be dead, and then the next person would kill the person to the left, and then that person would be dead, and then that next person, and we go in a circle and we continue this way until there was one person left, and then that person would commit suicide. So we've only done one sin as opposed to as opposed to everybody committing suicide. Yeah. And the legend has it that Josephus counted the number of people and figured out where he needed to sit in the circle to be the last person, and then he surrendered to the Romans. Smart. <laughs> and then didn't die. Yeah. So then the question I ask my students is, um, where does Josephus need to sit if, and then give him, uh, g- give him a number? Or is there a formula to figure out where you needed to sit for any number mm-hmm. of people? And then the, um, the only way to do it is to, g- they start and they do a bunch of examples, and the answer is actually incredibly complicated. There's an easy way to do it, but you need to 
learn a little bit of like binary notation. <laughs> okay. Um, but there is a formula to do it. Cool. I mean, the first one is don't be the don't be an even number because okay. if one kills two and three kills four and five kills six, it doesn't take very long to realize that being eight is, yeah. <laughs> is a problem. No good. Yeah. Um, but after that, then you've got um, then you've got what one kills three. And then five kills seven. seven. And then you got to figure out, okay, where do I stand? Um, so g- that, that's an example. Like yeah. You give them this problem and the students get jazzed about mm-hmm. trying to figure that out. Then if I just said, if I gave them the equation and it's kind of a complicated thing, and I said, hey, guys, if you know this equation, you can learn where to not stand in a, in a, in a, a murder game. They'd be like, in a crazy okay. murder circle. Yeah. Right. <laughs> They'd be like, oh, cool. Yeah. That's- They'd be leaving with the wrong message. They'd be leaving with the... Hey, you guys want to try a murder circle <laughs> yeah, exactly, message yeah. and not the, and all of them thinking they figured out the plan. Right. And then you have a bunch of dead kids and you're good. So, <laughs> so in modern, Very modern true. education, good. a lot of people sort of say like, Oh, we need problem-based learning. And I agree that problem-based learning is a really good thing. It's not because we've discovered something new. It's that problem-based learning is built on, on this, on using examples to understand ideas. Okay, so maybe this is why I hated geometry so much, because most of geometry is literally, here's a formula, learn it. And then here's how we can apply it in these exam- these problems. Yeah, but they always felt really contrived. But problems mm-hmm. were bad. Like, yeah. how long, contrived. how tall is that telephone pole? Bad. And you're like, why, why in the world would I yeah. need to know how or long? how long is the shadow if you lean a ladder? Like, just stuff like that. How would I need to, why would I need to know that? It's, yeah. it's like the lowest common denominator of fun stories, right? Yeah. They just picked shadows and ladders and right. it wasn't, mm-hmm. wasn't any good yes so here's the rule and then we're going to give you a bunch of sort of contrived examples yeah. and if you don't understand the rule and you can't bridge the rule to the example it's going to be a frustrating experience but the test is on friday so figure it out yeah. um versus here's a problem and then there are shortcuts and the shortcuts are figuring out the ideas yeah. so like we could say um you know here's a telephone pole uh how tall is that telephone pole uh like the, the difficult way is is climbing it with a tape measure. Um, the the easier way is realizing that um, you you could do you, you could do shadows with uh, with um, you, you do by shadows you can do by hop, hop, hypotenuse. Mm-hmm. You could there's a bunch of different ways you can figure, figure out, out how the long angle. it is. Yeah. You can figure right. out the angle, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So uh, and then when they sort of figure that out, then then if you understand the idea. By learning the examples, you can then apply it to everything. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you do it the other way around, you can only really learn how to um, uh, uh, maybe do only do that specific uh, example that you're given. You don't really right. realize that it can be applied to lots of different things. So are you arguing, say, learn from examples to rules rather than be given the rules to yes, be then exactly. given the examples and, of application? And, human, and, then, um, and people who more deeply understand something have done it by playing with many different examples and coming up with yeah. ideas. Um, okay, so that's, that, so that's maybe the direct way to do it, yeah. is you have an example of something. In literature class, we have a, sort of an indirect way. So um, if I wanted my students to be brave, um, uh, I, could give them an ex- I could give them an example of bravery. Oh, I thought you were going to say give them an exam, sorry. No, I could give them an example of bravery. Um, I could... I could try to cook up some Sorry. sort of, um, I could like, uh, um, you know, if we're going to do experiential learning, I could, you know, uh, tell them that there's a fire in the building and we got to get out of here. And then when we, when we leave the school and the kids, you know, that helped other kids would be like, that's an example of bravery. And be mm-hmm. like, well, they would learn that lesson, but that may not necessarily be practical or um, I may not want myself. Maybe I have a deficiency in, in, in bravery and right. I, I would be a bad example. Right. I can give them an illustration I can tell them a story of bravery, mm-hmm. and that ends up being the example. So that ends up being the go- this Eliza. Mm-hmm. That ends up being sure. the specific golden retriever. So um, I can give them an illustration of something, um, and all those illustrations end up being examples. And this is what we do in literature class. If I say Achilles is an example of a hero— if we play, and then, and I say Odysseus is an example of a hero, mm-hmm. and, and Sir Gawain is an example of a hero, and I say, these are all examples of heroes, and the student's going to be like, but they're so different. Yeah. And I say, yeah, but they were all heroes. And then they say, then if they play with figuring out the differences, figuring out the commonalities, and then disagreeing, agreeing, 
playing with the examples and they play it with their words and their, their back and forth conversation, then they can come up with a more concrete understanding of what the idea of heroism is. Yeah. Or instead of, or maybe a hero is a more difficult one. If I say Achilles was brave, Odysseus was brave, um, Sir Gawain was brave, hmm. but they were brave in all different ways. Achilles was brave because he knew he could beat everybody. Odysseus was brave because he knew he could smout, outsmart everybody. And uh, Sir Gawain was brave because he was convinced his life didn't matter, and if he died, it wouldn't be a great loss for Camelot. Right. So those are three different ways of being brave. Uh, and then you can say, well, is one of those ways better? Is hmm. one of those ways worse? Right. How are they the same? How are they different? And And then almost you get to the point where if you are – Giving the students good examples, it almost doesn't matter what question you ask or what question they ask of it. Mm-hmm. It's going to drive you to the heart of of the ideas that the stories are examples of. Yep. Does that make sense? So there's a deeper idea than each individual story. And yep. that's why you need – that's why you can't only read the Odyssey and say – I've learned everything there is about heroism because that's not the only example mm. that we have. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, but in many, but if you are if you are thinking typographically or typologically about the books that you read, there's almost no wrong question you can hmm. ask about the book. Can you rephrase that? Um, so if you're thinking typologically, um, I, so, you can always ask yourself like. Uh, how is Odysseus is, is it? Uh, how is Odysseus like a father? Mm-hmm. How is Odysseus like a king? Um, how is Odysseus like a sailor? How you know? So, so there aren't any. Uh, I'm wondering if there's questions that are so just like tangential to the story that like it's not um, that won't lead you to the heart of it. I, I yeah. Can't. So like um, you know, Odysseus also had a dog. Does he teach me what it is to be the owner of? Why a dog? not? Uh, I mean, maybe it does. But yeah. That, that, okay. So then he asking. teaches yeah. you to be the owner of a dog, and then um, and uh, what was the relationship between Odysseus and his dog? Well, he left <sighs> his dog alone for yeah. ten well, years. That's a bummer. But, but what does this tell us about the nature of dogs? Yeah. Well, how is Loyal, Argo perfect? How is Argo like a dog? Like how is Argo um, the perfect an dog? example yeah. of a dog? Yeah. It's incredibly loyal. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, uh, and then he he dies at his moment of extreme happiness of yeah. seeing his master, mm-hmm. right? Like, yeah. and so then this leads, you know, the student begins to say, like, well, my dog at home is really happy to see me when I when, and then they begin to put, bring their experience of the world into this experience, yep. and um, and so it's driving them into the heart of loyalty, and then also into understanding understanding dogs. Yep. Um, um, it would be different if it was a cat in that story. <laughs> sure. Yeah, Cause the cat with the cat would sort of stretch and yawn and walk away. Oh, you're back. You were gone. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. so interesting. Okay. So, but then that's to say that the, Od- so the Odyssey is not only true mm-hmm. as a story, but you're saying there are these moral lessons that are also not just moral lessons, but even lessons about dogs. Like sure. when you have okay. examples okay. of something you yeah. have, so everybody learns something when they see an idea embodied in an example. Okay. In, so what you're really talking about is uh, data parsing, kind of, mm-hmm. right? Every example that you're talking about, and a single example doesn't do much jo- much of the job, yep. but if you bring it into multiple examples and then drive at the data between it, it's really the practice of wit, what is, which, which you gave a talk on recently, between, mm-hmm. which is what are what is similar between these many things mm-hmm. and how do these things drive at a single idea, right? And, and finding where those things sort of end up. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the more... You could say that the more examples, the more data you have, the more likely you are to arrive at something true. So a great question you can say is, um, if you're using illustrations or another way to do this is with similes. So what is Argos like? Argos is like a, it's like your best friend mm. because he's so loyal. Yeah. Or um, what's Achilles like? Achilles, you know, uh, uh, Achilles is like a, and then... In many ways, whatever the student answers is going to have something that is going, even if they're funny, even if they're being irreverent. Um, there will be nuggets of truth. There will be nuggets of truth in there that, that that pulls everybody into the understanding of what these types are, I, yeah. are examples of ideas. Yeah. Um, even, you know, so um, um, uh, what kind of what kind of seamstress is Penelope? Right, you know, mm. and she's, you know, she's, she's, she's not a very good one because she keeps on doing her, undoing her work every night. But, um, you know, like any of these kinds of things. So illustrations mm. are almost like these indirect ways of talking about types. Yep. Whereas an example is a direct way of talking about a type. Okay. Um, um, and, and so like, um, 
yeah, we had a talk. We we had um, a speaker at our Paideia conference last week, and uh, he said, "What is a worldview like?" Or someone, did, someone, no, oh. no, 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 not even that. He says, "Can someone define worldview?" And someone raised their hand, and, and she said, "Glasses. It's the it's like they're like glasses. Yeah. They're like glasses. They're you see through them, and you can see things and understand things. Like so, she used an illustration." a metaphor, a simile, to, to define what a worldview is like. And we got, a, we got closer to the idea, the understanding of worldview, by using this illustration. So illustrations are figures of speech? They're always similes or metaphors? Yeah. And an example? Mm, no, when you, no, no. So when you have a story, when I said, if you think about the story topologically, mm. it's using the stories as illustrations, as of, illustrations. of ideas. Okay. So... Um, um, you can read, you can watch the movie The Godfather, mm-hmm. and it's just a story, and you watch the movie, and it's all great. Um, but if you start thinking about Michael Corleone as a business owner, or you think of Michael mm-hmm. Corleone as a father, mm-hmm. now you're thinking about the movie uh, typologically. Okay. Um, and then when you have the reaction to, he was a good version of this, he was a bad version of this, what kind of version of this was he like? Now you're beginning to go to the, to the thinking of things as types which are revealing ideas. Okay. Whereas if you just passively watch and you're like, that was super entertaining. <laughs> sure. um, and so this is where criticisms of, of characters can come in. If something is, is so on the nose trying to preach a moral lesson, right. maybe it's, a less, it's less interesting or it's less... Um, well, I think you're pointing out that the, the if a character is so one dimensional that they are trying to say a single thing rather right. than making it available for multiple things, yeah. you mm-hmm. know, like if a character is always good and always does the exact right th- thing and never struggles mm-hmm. with anything, well, mm-hmm. it's it's harder to come up with a. It, it's less true when you start asking about types, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, because it may, eventually all the ideas, all of these ideas, and all these uh, are interwoven into into. Well, we're gonna get a little woo woo in a bit. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, um, every every example incarnates an idea. Okay. Uh, if you want to put it that way. Okay. Um, and so you, we learn by um, seeing the ideas by. But they have to be understanding incarnate. the examples. Yeah. Or but by playing the goal with the examples. is eventually to get to those ideas. It's not just yeah. to stay in. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sure. So so what if um, my you know, lose some friends here. But what, what if say uh, we were talking about Harry Potter and I wanted to talk about (gasps) him who must not be named, Mm -hmm. right? Voldemort. (gasps) To me, he seems to be a fairly one dimensional character, Hmm. right? He is, he's just pure evil. He's pure evil. He's just the big bad. He's the, he's the big bad. And when is, so if I start asking questions like how is Voldemort as a friend, the answer is bad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) How is Voldemort as a, a leader? bad mm-hmm. how is voldemort as you know uh, you know a, a citizen yeah oh, he's, he's bad <laughs> like it doesn't it doesn't provide for much honest question ask, asking is that is that a fair criticism kind of, to make i think that's kind of where i'm getting at whereas if you had if you had a more nuanced version of bad like you can't yeah this is this is the problem with with villains in stories is, is that if they are just unthinkingly f- bad forces of destruction um if if you can't understand where they're coming from and why they're doing something then they're not they're not going to be actually good examples of bad in the real world yeah yeah even even satan in paradise lost exactly. is multi multi-dimensional right even he, just paradise lost even satan as christians satan understand it is satan. is a you know as an example of a he's not just he's not just bad he is he is an example of the a fallen angel of pride and right. um, yep. kind of like what we're talking about with the Enneagram, like there's always there's always the reciprocal of looking at a fault to understand the virtue behind it. So if right. you just, so that's why I mean even theologically Christians we say there's no true bad thing. Everything is a twisted version of a good thing. God didn't create something, and then there is something in that creation that is 100 percent bad. Um, you do get that in Gnosticism. You get that in, in some more Eastern thought with yin and yang. But in Christian theology, everything that exists has a reason, and its reason of existence is a good. Um, so if everything is an example, uh, everything that's an example is an example of an idea. Mm. All ideas are good, which is kind of a weird way to say all yeah. ideas. The existence is, of the thing is, 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 is there's a there's a right parts. Yeah, yeah, but not the entire idea might, itself might not be good. Yes. It's, okay. So yeah, I think that's a great example that if you have sort of the big bad in a story who has is unthinkingly evil that has no and there's no motivation behind it, uh, apart from just you need a thing to struggle against. Right. 
for the heroes to shine. Um, it, the, the whole thing kind of falls apart when you scratch the surface a little bit. Yeah. So this is a, I, I teach a lot from a book called Perrin's Guide to Literature, Structure, Sound, and Sense. Mm-hmm. It's it's a great book, but it often makes a distinction between um, commercial literature and <clears throat> and like literary li- literature, mm-hmm. like good, good books. Okay. Sometimes I think that's unfair. Uh, since the yes. printing press, there are very few writers who don't want their books to sell, mm-hmm. right? Sure. Like uh, Steinbeck wanted his books to sell. Sure. Um, uh, Charles Dickens, when you read the, the way he published serially and yeah. Um, yeah. Dostoevsky yeah. wanted his books to sell. Like these guys wanted money from yeah. their writings, but there is a difference in quality between something that is made for Com- a commercial audience versus an academic audience? Is that? Uh, I don't know. It's uh, and, th- and that's why it's kind of unfair. Is like commercially, yeah. these men were successful, right? Yeah. Dickens is one of the wealthiest writers that has ever walked the earth. Yes. Mm-hmm. But there is a quality in his books that allow that like reach closer to reality and don't just have mm-hmm. like he is bad and thoroughly bad, right? Um, even Raskolnikov is multidimensional, right? He yeah. he is bad because he is he misunderstands the world and he is trying to be good. Right, and it ends up mm. in a crazy triple murder that he. That's what's frustrating. Regrets about him. anyway. I, I finally um, read that this summer, and anyway, I hate Raskolnikov. I don't know. Whatever. Oh, did you finish the book? Yeah. Even still. Yeah. Uh, but even the, I don't know. The ending is unsatisfying because I kind of want that book yep. to be written mm-hmm. um, of his yeah. redemption. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. like that. I think that book would be really good. But that's in the same way that I'm coming around on the Purgatorio and moving past Inferno. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I'm just looking for more of that. So. Yeah. So. I don't know. That book allows for much more dimension in every character, right? Yeah. Even Razumikin like has problems. Yep. He's he's shown to be like the good, honest friend, but he's a little bit foolhardy and right. mouths off sometimes and gets himself into trouble. So I don't know. There's there's difference between like blank characters where I guess the focus is on plot, yep. like what mm-hmm. will happen next instead right. of why something will happen. So this is why the importance of the quality of the example needs to be high. Yeah. So if you if you like only ever trained anemic golden retrievers. Sure. Uh, and that was every golden retriever you ever had an example of was just like a sad sack that couldn't do anything because of its, like it couldn't, I don't know, um, metabolize food or whatever. Oh, yeah. Then like, you'd be like, well, golden retriever, you would have the wrong conception <laughs> low energy? of, yeah. of a golden mean? retriever. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So if every villain or if every bad guy that someone ever consumes in a story is just an unthinking force of pure evil, yeah. Which makes, which is why I always get really frustrated in in sort of superhero movies or action movies where the antagonist doesn't have any reason to exist other than just being the force to be resisted. Sure. Well, yeah, um, Thanos has a little bit of depth, but not that much depth. Then, I mean, that, that, that's then where I think, sort of, that's then, where Black Panther, I think, succeeded. I think exactly. AJ, I think AJ you had, but, you know, exactly because yeah. yeah. you had a you had a, 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 motive, a motive. An antagonist yeah. who had at least who was some, fighting for something. Who was fighting right. for something? Yeah, yeah. The same thing with uh, that the that first not the first Spider-Man movie, but the Spider-Man movie that came out with the Homecoming? Marvel. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's Homecoming. No, whatever. The one where, um, yeah, the, the, the bad guy was like, you know, this, this general contractor who got fired. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, and they like tell that whole story. And yeah, then, yeah. you know, so then you've got a little bit more, um, then you can actually ask yourself a question about like the nature of evil and yeah. family. Right. Right. And, um, and hmm. that kind of thing. So, so you do watch some superhero movies. Yeah. Okay, good. You make me feel better now. <laughs> um, anyway, so I, I, I teased at the um, I teased at the beginning that this is also a, a uh, what biblical teaching is. And because when we see examples of lessons needing to be learned or, or ideas needing to be passed down, we see them coming through illustrations and examples. So the famous one being parables. Hmm. So when Jesus wants his disciples to understand the kingdom of heaven— he doesn't – something he uses similes. Sometimes say the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Yep. Sometimes he won't even use a simile. He'll just walk in. He'll say, one day a farmer was sowing seed, mm-hmm. and the so seed fell on this ground, and it grew, and it fell on that ground. It kind of grew. It fell on this ground. The birds ate. It fell on this ground and got all, like, scorched. Mm-hmm. Um, the end. <laughs> and then the and student, then doesn't explain it. And doesn't yeah, explain yeah. it. And yeah, then until he talks the disciples the are yeah, like yeah. – they come up. They're like, hey, uh, <laughs> what was that all about? And then um, was, it, was it often Peter? I feel like that's yeah. something Peter would do. Like, hey, uh, <laughs> so that story. Yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> like, Peter was very. Uh, he was a yeah. blunt guy. Yeah. Now, at least in that parable, Jesus is like, oh, the seed is like the gospel, right? Right. And so then, already right there, the seed is like the gospel. Well, that is a met, that is a simile, and that is now a key 
that is being given to the disciples to interpret and understand the example, the parable, to understand the idea, the kingdom of God. Got it. Okay. So they, and then, so uh, uh, Jesus is doing this because the disciples will understand not only the kingdom of God better, but the kingdom of God cannot be cannot be given in a in a definition on the board. All right, guys, right. here's a definition on the board. The kingdom of God, just like all right, here's the definition of a triangle. Um, uh, because it's so big, it needs to be. Uh, there needs to be lots of examples of it for you to even get the hint of what the idea is. Mm-hmm. My favorite uh, story in the entire Bible is when is after David has killed Uriah and has taken Bathsheba for his wife. Nathaniel comes to David, and with the mission to rebuke David for this sin. And he comes to David, and remember what he does? Tells him a story. Tells him a story. He's like, hey, David, there was a shepherd. And a shepherd had a beloved sheep, and he loved it like a son, and it ate at his table and slept with him in his in his tent, and he, he uh, kept that, that sheep as his own beloved child. And then one day the ruler of the land had a dignitary coming in, and he needed to sacrifice a lamb. Instead of taking one of his own, he took, took the shepherd's beloved lamb, right. slaughtered it, and fed it to this dignitary. And David goes, that man must be killed. Right. And then the, the, my favorite words, probably in David all of scripture. David flies off the handle a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Kill that guy. Yeah. My favorite words in all of scripture. And then Nathaniel says, you are that man. Right. And David is like, and then he has this big old long thing, word from the Lord. And David is cut to the core. Whereas if you if he came in and was like, you did a terrible thing. You took right. Bathsheba as your wife. David may not see. David may not right. receive. That direct uh, assault of, 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 of Nathan giving the idea Someone who does this is a bad man. Right. Um, David may not see that because he has he just, he's not incentivized to see his own sin. But when David is given the indirect story, he sees it. And then when he realizes that he applies it to himself, then he actually is driven to real repentance. Yep. And so, and even Nathan is doing, like Nathan is tailoring it even to his audience. David was a shepherd. He would have understood the relationship between shepherd and sheep and that sacred bond that the shepherd has of protecting the sheep and that being broken by some like, you know, rich, good for nothing guy who just took it. You know, if if Nathan had told a story about a fisherman Mm -hmm. and his fishing rod or, you know, like it probably wouldn't have landed as much because Nathan, because David wasn't a fisherman. So he, you know, he made it vivid and memorable Mm -hmm. to his audience Um, and it touched his soul um, more than if he just told him what he did was wrong. Um, because he used examples and then brought David and then used the examples through which David could see the idea. And the idea was that he was, a, he was a sinful man. So I mean, you're, you're guessing that David probably had a favorite sheep too. Sure. Maybe, and maybe it. even and Nathan knew this. A little, uh, little floofs. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so then, floofs. so then the, 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 sort of the, the, the idea w- is that you learn through these examples. So biblical teaching, if you're thinking of what does the Bible, how is the Bible an example of good teaching? Right. Um, the idea it's getting at is we teach through um, the, uh, by understanding all these examples and coming to ideas from that. Yeah. Um, we are, and so, so many ways, so some people call it mimetic teaching because you are, you are using all of these examples and trying to see how they're, how they're copies of each other to get to ideas. Mm-hmm. Some people call it an incarnational understanding of teaching because every example incarnates an idea. Hmm. And that gets really interesting because um, Jesus is incarnational. Uh, and um, um, another word for idea is is word, right? Like, uh, like a, uh, um, um, uh, we have this idea, we, we see all these golden retrievers mm-hmm. and we're like, okay, they're all examples of what? What is this idea? Golden well, what is the golden retrieverness, yeah. right? This idea is, is this word. If we yeah. encapsulate this in a word, the word itself is not an example. The word is the, is the, the type, right? right? Um, uh, or the word is the idea. And then from that, uh, from that word, we have these little incarnations of golden retrievers. Mm-hmm. Well, then you have this idea that in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and Jesus is the word. Uh, it, it can get a little woo-woo that, you know, how that this man is the incarnation of all ideas, if we're going to follow the logic. I don't know. Right. I mean, that's when my head starts to get sore and I start to say like, does everything – so um, are all words examples of Jesus? Hmm. 
So are all ideas examples of Jesus? I, I was thinking of this back That's when you were doing your Enneagram. You were yeah. like, all of these types of people are an attribute of God. And so I was thinking like, is that true of all ideas? That all ideas are in our attributes of the word. Um, or at least, so, and you said before that, so evil is just a twisting of a good thing. Mm-hmm. So you'd say the good component of any of those ideas could be pointing to Christ. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I have to think about that. Yeah, I'd have to think about that too. I don't know if I'm comfortable enough to say that, because um, then like, you're brushing up against pantheism, that like the tree is the example of treeness and the right. treeness mm-hmm. is an example of the word and right. the word is God. You know, right. then you're, you're... I mean, you might also be sort of fuddling with translation there, like, because in the original it's logos, right? Yep. And logos was understood to be the organizing principle and logic of the world, which is a little bit different than saying like, he is an example of everything rather than the underlying system under which everything falls. But if everything right? is... That cor- avoids the pantheism. But if, if yeah. something is... is if, if if all ideas are subject to the organizing principle, the logos of the world, um, then I guess what then how does every idea show us a facet of the organizing principle? Right. That's what I'm getting well, at. Well, that's, that's what Dante asked when he wrote his book, mm-hmm. right? Everything was well, an, the anagogical level, right? Yeah, where uh, to end times, or are you talking about? Yeah, where okay. everything relates to the, the seeker and his journey towards Christ. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then, mm-hmm. I mean... So, uh, um, sorry, listeners, if you're, if we're losing you on a few of these terms here. So yeah, Yeah, so the few things we referenced, uh, Mm -hmm. Argos was the dog from the Odyssey Mm -hmm. and Uh he's a nice little puppers and Uh he dies in a pile of duty after seeing Odysseus home for the first time in Uh 20 years. And Logos is sort of the, we talked about, um, mythical form. Is that what it was? What your episode on norms and nobility forever ago? Yeah, Yeah, kind of. There's, there's also like Logos is, is understood to be kind of like, the outer sphere where everything lives like that is oh. the realm of pure thought. Right. There's, an, there's a very early episode about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and logos is also like the organizing principle. It's also connected to logic and mind and reason. Yeah. So if you think of it kind of like he is the reason of the world, that's, that's probably more to the point than saying he is the word. Right. But if he's the idea of yeah. the world yeah, and if he's the organizing principle of the world, like, like, Ideas are the organizing principles of our examples of golden retrievers. Yeah. And if the logos is the organizing principle of creation, everything, right. then everything is an example that somehow points back to the logos. Well, you you yeah. a little bit ago said that nothing evil was created, everything mm-hmm. was good. Mm-hmm. So how do how does a thing in its purity reflect reflect the creator, I mm-hmm. think is yeah. an apt question. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And I, I add with it in its purity, because if we wanna start saying like this thing is thoroughly corrupt, how does that reflect Jesus? I think you're probably heading down the wrong path. But then you'd say nothing is, Graham, you'd say nothing is thoroughly corrupt? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so, I mean, how would you do that with, if we're going back to Raskolnikov, right? Like, he had he had an idea of a better world. Self-sacrifice for the nations yeah. is what he wanted. He he had an idea that, 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 you know, great sacrificing action was needed to save the world. Well, yeah. that's not far from God, from the cross. Right. It's just, it was just wrongly applied right. through, um, pride and ego as opposed to through, um, through, you know, what actually happened at Calvary. Even so. if you watch Fight Club, like there's there's a lot of principles sure. in there that line right up with Christianity, mm-hmm. right? Don't be materialistic. Um, don't hold yourself to be high. Like don't have something else that you're you're sort of organizing your life for. That's not that's, that's outside of yourself and not, not yourself. Materialism, yeah. There the it was basically Christianity with God removed. You add yeah. God back into that mix, and whatever flight was happening in Fight Club is pretty dang close, yeah. except for the fighting. That so then, so then, oh, but, but this is but then that is the correct that is the right exercise is being able to. Um, um, it's kind of like, how do you understand counterfeits? Well, you don't learn all the counterfeit things. You don't learn all of the sinful things. You learn what is, you learn the logos. Right. And then you can see the logos and everything. It's not, you learn all the ways the logos can go wrong. Right. Um, um, so, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, so this is, uh, we kind of, I, I don't know where I wanted to <laughs> land on this thing. Um, but then the the good teacher is somebody who always is trying to get the students to see the ideas by using illustrations and examples. Um, so if you you have the place you want the students to go, and then depending on how the students are reacting to the conversation or to your class, um, you are then um, trying to bring them to that place through your questions or through the way that you structured the conversation. 
Uh, and it has to be a conversation. It right. can't just be, here's a list of equations, go and learn them, and we're going to apply them next week. Um, I mean, our students, kids will be able to do that, but they're not going to, they're not going to own it. They're not going to see it. They're not going to see the idea of triangles by right. doing that. Um, they're not going to see the idea of, of any kind of virtue by learning about, um, by learning ab- uh, about it as a definition. They need to come to the definition themselves by seeing enough examples. And that's easier with triangles, but it's harder with courage mm-hmm. because um, uh, it can be courageous to do something. It can be courageous not to do something. Uh, and then understanding the difference between those two things is a sign of is sort of the maturity that you need. Uh, or if the student can accurately see courage where courage is it maybe readily the stereotypical thing. So if everybody sees a child and says, oh, that guy's just uh, that, that, that guy, he's just scared. But when you really know that, no, he's actually courageous for because in his in his passivity, right. um, uh, uh, and that's that's sort of the sign of of, of maturity or, or understanding the idea for the thing itself is that you can now rightly see it in examples. Yeah. Um, um, so if you found this mangled dog that had no fur and oh. it was all uh, you know it was like by the side of the road and was unkempt, um, if you are uh, you know you know enough about golden retrievers that there is that you could actually see that it is an example of a golden retriever even though it's completely um, um, been uh, mistreated then you are someone who understands the idea of golden retriever because you can see it in something that doesn't readily look like it right. does that make sense and that's yeah. the truth and then if you can do that with virtues if you can do that with um, with uh, all of, with sort of in the realm of ideas and that I think that's a a thing that we are we would want we would say is an attractive quality in human beings and something that we would be wanting our students to grow into if hmm, that makes sure. any sense yeah yeah it does that's all i got i don't have anything else cool. i know um it's um so then the teacher the teacher then I, oh yeah this last thing then the teacher needs to be open to um those ideas having currency and purchasing power in their own behaviors so that you can't just teach the same book the same way you've taught it every year every year you need to let the ideas behind the examples hit you anew and learn the new facets of this and the students will realize like oh something's going on because mr hannenberger mr donaldson they're talking about this as if it matters (laughs) or you know they're talking about this as if there's more to know that they haven't already known but i thought they were the teacher and they're supposed to know everything right um, but mis- you know, so this happened last year with 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 um, uh, crime and punishment. Um, oh shoot, I'm uh, Raskolnikov. I think um, there was something about his arrogance of knowing things and using people as as means, and uh, it was something I had never noticed in him before. And um, um, or th- the way he belittled people, or there was something in there that that struck me. And I, I wish I, I remember we we, we t- I. Um, I talked about it in front of the entire senior class at some mm-hmm. point, and, and that was somewhere a student came and said, oh, for the first time, like, it seems like this book has some sort mm-hmm. of, m- this book means something for human life as opposed to just we're sort of reading it for the story. Like, you, I was thinking of Raskolnikov typologically and then applying it to my own humanity and saying, like, if I continue to act in this way what's to stop me from thinking and behaving and being like miserable raskolnikov yeah. i think that that's kind of the uh, the idea yeah that's good all right cool thank you graham uh we do we have any cla- do you want to read that quote that you were going to do last time oh yeah to? last time we referenced a quote from moby dick that i think it's it's my favorite portion of moby dick it's in chapter 96 which is about the tripods or the triworks. It's where they take a bunch of whale blubber and they pitch it into these pots and they yeah. render it down. Um, but they do it all night and they end up looking like these, like in the evening in the fire, they look like these devils pitching mm-hmm. things into the, and it's, it's this really horrifying image. And our author, uh, Ishmael is standing at the, at the till and he, he ends up getting turned around. And mm-hmm. so he's like driving the ship backwards and almost crashes it and f- realizes it at the last second and turns around. So that's the context of this quote. It's a little bit long, but I'll read. It's just so good. Um, this has nothing to do with anything we talked about today, but it's just a good piece of literature. Yeah. Look not too long in the face of the fire, O man. Never dream with thy hand on the helm. Never turn thy back to the compass, except the first hint of the hitching tiller. Believe not the artificial fire, when its redness makes all things look ghastly. Tomorrow, in the natural sun, the skies will be bright, 
Those who glared like devils in the forking flames, the morn will show in far other, at least gentler, relief. The glorious golden glad sun, the only true lamp, all others but liars. Nevertheless, the sun hides not Virginia's dismal swamp, nor Rome's accursed Campania, nor wide Sahara, nor all the millions of miles of deserts and of griefs beneath the moon. The sun hides not the ocean, which is the dark side of this earth, and which is two-thirds of this earth. So therefore, that mortal man who hath more of joy than sorrow in him, that mortal man cannot be true, not true or undeveloped. With books, the same. The truest of all men was the man of sorrows, and the truest of all books is Solomon's. And Ecclesiastes is the fine hammered steel of woe. All is vanity. All. This willful world hath not got hold of unchristian Solomon's wisdom yet. But he who dodges hospitals and jails and walks fast crossing graveyards and would rather talk of operas than hell calls Cowper, Young, Pascal, and Rousseau poor devils, all of sick men, and throughout a carefree lifetime swears by Rabelais as passing wise and therefore jolly. Not that man is fitted to sit down on tombstones and break the green damp mold with unfathomably wondrous Solomon. But even Solomon, he says, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain, i.e., even while living, in the congregation of the dead. Give not thyself up then to the fire, lest it invert thee, deaden thee, as for the time it did me. There is a wisdom that is woe, but there is a woe that is madness. And there is a Catskill eagle in some souls that can alike dive down into the blackest gorges and soar out of them again and become invisible in the sunny spaces. And even if he forever flies within the gorge, that gorge is in the mountains, so that even in his lowest swoop, the mountain eagle is still higher than other birds upon the plain, even though they soar. So, I mean, even there, just to, to close it, that book is even teaching its reader to think about this uh, typologically. Mm -hmm. So the, the example is, is that Ishmael was staring into the fire and the, his boat started to turn and he almost crashed it. And then he's giving the like almost moral lesson. Mm -hmm. And he says, so too with books and so too with, uh, with, with X, Y, and Z. My right. example is an illustration of this idea. And he goes on to tell you how to think. Yeah, of it. So in many ways, Moby Dick teaches the reader how to read uh, yeah. typologically. Yep. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. good. Oh, good. man, I love that passage. I could talk about it for another 20 minutes, but we got to kill it. So. Yeah. so this has been Classical Stuff. You should know. You can find us online at classicalstuff.net. You can email us at classicalstuff at veritasacademy.net. You can find us on Twitter at Classical Stuff, spelled C-L-S-S-C-A-L -S -S stuff. And I think that is it. So for Graham, AJ, and Thomas, we are signing off. Bye. Bye. Bye.